assalamu alaikum to the members of the network and all of those who have tuned in this evening. I am Mr. Rizvi, CEO of Creative Rhythms, and I welcome you all to the season finale of our show, An Era of Gamification on CXO Global TV. Now, talking about CXO Global, CXO Global is a knowledge sharing platform for all C levels and influencers across the nation and throughout the world. Every time the network tries to bring together the thought leaders of the industry so we can all collectively discuss important issues, happenings, and contribute to our learnings. Moving ahead with our topic for this last episode, a game changer. I truly believe we live in the most fascinating times known to man. Just think about it. If you wanted to impact a million people's lives 200 years ago, then you had to be an emperor of an empire. If you wanted to impact a million people's lives just 20 years ago, you had to be a prime minister. Today, you can impact a billion people's lives just sitting in your pajamas at the comfort of your own space. What we choose to say to them is completely our choice. And that is the impact we're all making every day. Now, from a young age, we create games for ourselves, games that make an ordinary activity into something fun and rewarding. Our past three episodes have been with some great industry leaders who have talked in depth about what gamification is, the differences between gamification, gamified learning, and simulation, and whether this is just a fad or our future, and how there is so much to learn from the gaming industry so that it can be applied to enhance our experiences. The trick really is that in order for us to impact this future, we need to start asking better questions. And gamification is already touching every aspect of our lives. Today, we will be talking about how it is basically inherent in us as human beings. We're also going to be talking about how companies in different industries are doing amazing things with gamification and the impact it has on our business and hence our lives. So to discuss all of this, we have a great lineup of panelists uh, for the day. Joining us today is Sadaf Shahid, who is the founder of Circle Caring for Children. Uh, Circle uh, is basically a therapy center that provides holistic quality caring to children suffering from autism, speech language, and hearing impairment, and other developmental and communication disorders. The second guest today is Sabika Nazim. Uh, she is head of product design at Amplitude, an accomplished product leader with more than 15 years of experience leading cross-functional teams of product designers, product managers, and engineers that have helped shape and delivered critically acclaimed, creative, highly functional, and engaging both products on both web and mobile. Our third guest for the day is Himra Mursal. She is a HR director at Reckitt. Uh, Himra is a seasoned HR professional with over 15 years of diversified experience of working with blue chip companies in pharmaceutical, FMCG, food and beverages, and service industries. Himra has a deep knowledge of Asia Pacific markets, handled assignments in markets beyond Pakistan, and has been acknowledged as high potential at all stages of her professional life. Our fourth guest is Alper Berber. He's a gamification designer and trainer. Uh, at Brand New Games uh, Turkey. He's a volunteer of gamification Turkey as well. He's one of the pioneers of gamification in Turkey and an author of a book on gamification and has lectured gamification in academia. So I'm really uh, you know, excited to have you all here. Starting off, my first question is gonna be from uh, Sadaf. Sadaf, I want to, because tomorrow is, uh, you know, is the World Autism Day. And this is really nicely placed that you are with us uh, on the session. And I want to talk to you about how did you feel that we needed a center like circle in Karachi? And, uh, you know, have you ever thought of expanding and taking this to other cities? Yes, uh, thank you, Isan. Thank you very much for having invited me. And while you were introducing everybody else, I thought I am the most a technical, non technical person here. All the people, they are. So so much related to you know the corporate marketing and technology um my my work like i am by profession a speech language pathologist and um you know uh, my own son had a hearing loss so uh, at that time now he's mashallah 30 so at that time uh, there were very limited facilities but as he grew up there were more more uh, options for you know hearing impaired children but as I studied in the same field, I started seeing more and more children coming in with autism, almost one out of every third kid or fourth kid who, is, who would come for an evaluation would be diagnosed as having autism. So, you know, I, use, I had a private practice. I used to work, you know, 
uh, one on one and then everybody would say okay you know you give so much time to one and you have so many people waiting outside which you never uh, are able to give enough time to cater to so then we decided we started with just two therapists and a client load of 12 and today by the grace of god we are uh, a team of 20 with a client load of almost 100 children that we are working with they all uh, some have autism some have hearing impairment adhd language delays etc and we provide them speech therapy occupational therapy remedial social skills everything so okay this is the small thing and yes when we come to gamification it was very interesting uh you know i when isn invited i thought yes we can i can learn from all of you and at the same time give in my little bit also No, actually, you know, uh, that, that's how you said you're not technical. I would like to say over that that's the beauty of gamification right now. That mm. it is actually, you know, being applied to every industry, and you know, it's something which is actually changing habits and everything, and the potential it has. It's mm. amazing, and yes. you know, that, that is. Yeah, you know, when the when the time is, you know, we can't stop kids from using screen. So yes. why not use it positively? So Absolutely. here also, so we use game games as well as you know board games, which we'll talk about later. And I think we should go on to other speakers. Yes. Otherwise, okay, I, so I can talk for an hour actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll now move to Sabika with my second question. Okay, yeah. Sabika, uh, talking about uh, product design, right? Uh, when we talk about gamification, product design, there's this. entire new world over there right so we really want you to uh, you know uh, talk about that and how gamification is is used in all of this i mean um, so i think that uh, let me try and uh, approach it slightly different so, so to us for product for designing products gamification is usually just a tactic that we use to create more user engagement and Uh, especially like if you look at sort of where we are going and where we're heading especially in digital transformation in the enterprise world in sort of uh, the kind of products that are my customers the company's cust- the company that I work at it's now taking a step further and it's saying that hey we want personalization and personalized gamification for our users because whatever we understood of gamification before which was sort of tactics around let's say like you know there was a time when everybody was like oh like every product every social product should have a leaderboard or <laughs> every social product should do x things or like you know like add these badges and stuff but there was a limit at which they were like they would like those things no longer work so how do you personalize like how do you use personalization and game gamify sort of this you know some of the sort of paths that a user is taking in a product uh to uh increase engagement um and so but i am actually in a weird situation because i design a product that helps you helps other people do that so my product helps you understand user behavior so what we're saying is everybody's people come to amplitude because they're like okay i want to understand what is the user journey that my user is taking how do how are people doing different steps where do people drop off where do i need to up my game for engagement and is there is gamification one of the tactics that we use to make that uh, to amplify that aha moment sounds like a thing i got that. All right. Uh, moving to you, Himra. Uh, my question will be that you know when we talk about gamification in HR, you know where all can it be applied and what are its application and benefits? Because I feel, especially in Pakistan, uh, you know when we talk about HR, there are a lot of companies that have still really not adapted to its ways. Okay. Um, I think there was some. Connectivity issue. So I've understood the question that you know uh, why gamification is there and it can be used in HR, but a lot of companies haven't adopted it. Yes, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yes. 
So, um, firstly, um, of course, you know, this is still really new in Pakistan with few companies that have actually introduced it. It's, it's about, you know, applying those game design theory in every situation. And, um, you know, what, what it helps is in terms of, you know, for example, if I want to get these problem solving skills, uh, decision making, you know, if people can use real numbers, that is something that we can do. But coming to your question, where, um, you know, while it's there and not a lot of companies are adapting to it, it's probably because either, you know, they have them and if you want to customize it, it's expensive. So companies do not want to invest a lot of money there uh, because you know we still the traditional uh, means of. Uh, okay, Himra, sorry, I'm gonna pause you here. Is everyone uh, getting like a obviously oh, second? Is everyone getting a lag in the voice, or is it just at my? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Himra, there's a connectivity issue. Uh, if you can switch off your video and let, yeah, now say something. Is it better? Say, uh, like, just say something so we can just. Um, hi, is it better now? Yeah, it's better. Yes, yes. All right. So coming to your question where, you know, you talk about um, while it's still there and companies are not, um, you know, really adapted to um, the gamification bit is that, you know, there are off-the-shelf ready available products that you can buy. They will just go, okay, you want to check your problem-solving skills, etc. But the moment you talk about customization, it costs a lot of money and investment. And of course, you know, it's not a one-time thing. You want to make it more sustainable. And every organization, I think that's where one of the just lie, where uh, a lot of companies uh, would want to buy it. The other bit is about our habits. You know, we're still relying on the traditional method. Uh, we like to interview people. We don't like to think through, you know, the simulation-based game program, performance, or, you know, to be analytical around that. And we still, you know, rely on our own, um, uh, you know, own, own assessments rather than a more technical sort of assessment. I can give an example. For example, we're not using it in HR right now. I'm locally but we're using it in sales and it was developed in-house and we're actually, we actually identified the sales champions so that every single person in the organization can see who the winner is of that per month or that particular so we're actually extending it to the HR realm okay okay so we I think we just completely lost the connection okay uh, let, let me take uh, to my phone then. Okay, so to the time Himra rejoins Alper, I'm going to ask you uh, the next question. Uh, okay, so I got really excited when I got to know that you have written a book on gamification. And my first question is going to be on that, that I want to ask you that, you know, uh, I'm sure you must have felt that, you know, this has so much potential. And the need for it has not really been explored as such. And that is, you know, something that got you to writing this book. So if you could just uh, take us a little through that. You're on mute. Yes, sorry. Uh, did you understand, right? You are asking for me to how did I write a book about gamification? Uh, um, before uh, writing about the book, I have to uh, go a little back uh, about my gamification journey uh, because when we uh, started uh, making gamification, um, we were not, yeah, we started gamification and while we were building an app application. We asked that question, how can we make people uh, use more and how can we make people uh, recommend that application to others? And why we are uh, trying to find the answer for the question? Uh, we are met with gamification, and after that, oh yes, gamification is cool. Gamification is something uh, makes us funny and makes us motivated for different things, like um, uh, having good times with our friends, uh, eating well, stopping smoking, anything as in our lives. 
And after time and time, we decided to make it commercially in Turkey. And we have uh, we had some networks with abroad. And on those area, we work so much. We tried so many uh, things about gamification with projects, we did trainings, and uh, you get informed, you get uh, learned, and you uh, bring all the information, all the knowledge in a place, all those data in a place, in papers or on uh, words or PDF documents in a computer, and you say that yes, let's collect it in one big document and um, find whenever you need, uh, you need to uh, look back again on information or on a topic. And when you may make this process, when you make those uh, gathering of informations, the book has occurred by itself. Okay, great, really good. Uh, is it uh, available on Amazon and stuff, or is it just uh, is it just available in Tur uh, Turkey at the moment? Uh, not on Amazon, but uh, on Sejkin uh, Publishing House has published uh, my book. Uh, it's in Turkish, only in Turkish, and we will uh, going to translate in future. And not Amazon, maybe you can find it Amazon, but you can find it uh, on their own uh, website. Maybe I can later, uh, if people follow me on LinkedIn or somewhere else, they can find it, find the link if they want to buy. If they have to buy, buy a Turkish gamification book. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, uh, moving on to you, Salah. My second question is going to be that how is gamified therapy helping kids and adults through various issues? You're on mute. Oh, okay, you're again on mute. How come? Uh, no, I'm not mute from here. Now we can hear you. You were first yeah. on mute. What we're doing is we're putting everyone on mute so there's no yeah. uh, next front mm -hmm. mute. So now we can hear yeah. you. Okay, no, no problem. Okay, so the thing is, okay, when we, uh, you know, there are lots of concepts that we need to teach kids. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, when you try to teach them, supposing even if, even if it is just simple vocabulary, and you know, teaching them how many syllables are there in a word, or how what and and which sound does this word begin with? So if we use it in a way by using a game, it helps children a lot. You know, while growing, we used to play simple games like Ludo, and we thought it's a simple game, but actually, it's a very you know difficult game that requires uh, you know good memory i mean working memory it requires decision making it requires counting it requires attention and flexibility which are all parts of executive functions so these games did not only teach us they did not teach us okay, you know it was not just a way to pass our time it they were all teaching uh, these games were teaching us social skills so these days, uh, you know, a, a lot of children come to us with who have memory. Supposing, let me give you an example of memory. If a child has difficulty with memory, supposing he has attention deficit, autism, learning disability. So these children have difficulty memorizing in, uh, you know, words. They will use the word one day and they will forget it, uh, forget it another day. So there are many, if we just keep, okay, come on, say the word four times, five times, they may not be able to say it. But if there is a game, what we do is supposing there are three words that we are teaching and we light and every time we, the therapist says the word, the word lights up. And if the other, the, when she says the second word, it lights up. When she says the third word, it, it lights up. And then she asks, what, in which sequence did the words light up? So the child, out of excitement, because in the end he's going to get a star or he's going to get a reward, the child would say that. Then she might change the sequence, and the words would light would would you know light up in a different sequence, and the child has to say that again. And it could be just be simple colors, it could be the name of animals, it could be the names of fruits, and there are other games also that are that we that we use to teach you know social skills because there's a lot of reinforcers involved. So a very interesting game which is called memory memory game which we all have played 
as kids and we used to play it on cards but now it's available in very interesting apps and children love playing it on it they can spend the, we are able to increase the attention span on it as well and then we can move them back because there's a very strong controversy these days between uh, you know giving gadgets to a child or not giving gadgets to a child but when uh, you know what i believe is using it positively meaningfully and supervised technology isn't bad because you know everything that re- that exceeds the limit becomes bad when you when children start using things unsupervised is bad but when you start channelizing it because technology is there to stay technology is there to stay and we can't deprive our children but we can't even have it give them unsupervised access to it so but when we make these in you know interesting games they are very interesting games like luminosity cogmed that we use for cognitive development of children and they and they and neuroscience has uh, proven that these uh, you know definitely help in gaming result and now after in, in my when you know when we come back again i'll tell you how we are even using it in you know communication as alternate means of communication oh that's really fascinating great mm-hmm. okay uh, <clears throat> sabika moving to you you were talking about that you know uh, you actually design the product and you get it ready for the people to you know uh, you know uh, to put the experiences through it so if you are to walk us through the journey of the uh, you know of designing that entire uh, you know thing that how you guys do that and how the designer actually goes through the journey of making something uh, that would just be lovely sure um i think that generally now if you look at product design it always starts with a problem right uh, if you are saying that i am designing it, like product design is now very different than sort of just visual design when we whenever we're talking about product design we're very very conscious of hey do we really understand the problem have we asked five ta- why five times because we want to peel the layers of the onion to really understand the problem that we're solving uh there was actually steve portrigal is one of the guys he's a really great uh, user researcher and he was sort of here at our office and he was talking about uh uh this concept of uh, uh something being sufficient versus something being satisfactory and like how do you actually sometimes you're designing things that you think could be satisfactory but whatever the user is currently doing is it sufficient will they actually go ahead and change their behavior in order to actually embrace your solution of a problem so it all starts with the problem that's the key and like there are various methods like for example like you know qualitatively trying to and talking to user trying to sort of Im- seeing them in their environments how do you actually like ask those questions quantitatively if a solution already exists for something are you looking at data how are people doing that does it actually match the qualitative feedback that has been sort of thrown so that's sort of the that's the start of the product design process um and then once you actually have a good problem identified once you have sort of uh um you know once you know that like okay i am confident in my hypothesis that i am going to try and do some of these experiments in order to actually try and see if it solves the problem there are various ways there isn't a one size fits all to all user problems it isn't that like you know like if you go and read a lot of blogs it will be like oh ideation and brainstorming and like and then you know like they everybody says that there are like five or six steps but in reality that's not how it really it, it is it isn't one size fits all in my team what i force people to do is like i said like think about the problem are you able to articulate your hypothesis really well sometimes it's a very low hanging fruit it doesn't require sort of like a design sprint it doesn't require a brainstorming workshop it requires just very small tweaks in the process and then you are able to ship something and uh, you're good to go sometimes it requires all of those steps it's like oh my god this is a huge problem how do we break it down can we make it a smaller problem and then we say that okay uh 
So no one size fits all. Start with a problem. Keep asking why. And and then see and then experiment. And like, I mean, I say, like, if you talk to anybody in my team, people would say that Savika's favorite thing to say is you are what you ship. So at the end of the day, nothing matters. The process doesn't matter until you actually ship something and you learn something from it. Uh, so the the journey is like it it's a never ending journey. It's almost like always going in a continuous loop. But it's the process of start with the problem, do something, learn something, go back to the problem, do something, learn something, and keep going in the loop. Very well said, Sabika. So being in the design field myself, <laughs> I can't agree more with you because really the. You know, it, there is never a formula to this. There is never, and you know, uh, you have to just keep trying and all of the strategies that are in place, uh, you know, the, the brainstorming and everything, it actually, you know, happens when you have, uh, when you can't think of something, but usually when you are in depth with a brief, then you don't even get to those strategies. You think of a thing and you know, that's how it starts to multiply. So very rightly said. Okay, moving on to you, Imra. I'm glad you reconnected. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask you that, you know, uh, when we talk about a comparison, that when we look at gamified unit and we look at a traditional method, do you feel that employee motivation and performance level, really, do we see a difference in that uh, when we look at gamified experiences and traditional experiences? Um, okay, um, thank you for that question. And I think I'll just pick on what Sabika just highlighted that, you know, when you're using systems and, you know, online tools, it's easy for you, to, it's easy for you to gauge the data. But um, I've yet to see the research where it really says that, you know, either you're using the traditional methods or the gamified versions that really lead to employee motivation. But I know um, that, you know, um, it's an experience if you use it for employee engagement initiatives, you can really understand how engaged the employee is, you involve them into different gamified uh, processes. And then, you know, from the data you can derive, okay, the person is there. But I think one uh, measure for it would be that, you know, the more engaged your employee is, the more, more productive they would be. So I think you can get an indicator of uh, motivation from there. But I think it really helps because uh, with gamification, um, not sure if I was... Um, Claire, um, earlier, um, I gave an example that, you know, we use gamification in our sales. So, you know, there are certain sales targets and sales KPIs that people need to follow. They all do it, you know, through their phones. They log in, log on to an app and everybody, it's so transparent that everybody's competing, you know, with the other region. They're competing with their colleagues, but they know that, you know, towards the end, the person who does the best wins and it, it's all gamified. That's data coming out. So I think from the traditional method, this really, really helps because when you're trying to reach a bigger audience, technology helps there. Oh, that's great. And I'm glad that you repeated your example because uh, we could hear you, but yeah, uh, the essence of it has come out better right now. Yeah, so great. Okay, moving on to you, Alper. Uh, you know, when I was reading a little about your company, uh, I believe that you people are based in Turkey and Netherlands, right? Where you're working right now. So I wanted to ask you that, uh, when we look at uh, different cultures that are in place, uh, do you think that even the experiences are are designed then differently according to that? Uh, when we look at things, if you could just you know elaborate a little on that. Yes, definitely, because uh, the main point of gamification design is human. It's human-centric design, and you try to motivate people for behavior change. What is behavior change? And we told about that. And uh, making people chewing gum instead of smoking or drinking soda instead of coke. Uh, but uh, uh, the motivation of people uh, changes, differs from uh, region to region, from demography to demography, from um, <clears throat> gender to gender. That's why uh, we observe and uh, we see differences from European people and from Turkish people. For example, Europeans are more uh, close to feedback. They are more likely to give and get feedback. And they don't, and they get happy if you give a, a feedback, a negative feedback, a feedback that helps uh, him or her to improve itself. But in this region, and we are close regions, I'm sure you will 
uh, for me. Um, it's not good to uh, tell people their uh, negative sides. That's why um, this is one of the uh, observations we, we get. And there are a lot of, for example, in Turkey, uh, the regional tasks, regional uh, crisis, regional uh, problems or benefits are different. European side is different. And uh, that's why, why we are making a gamification design in our analyze site, our analysis uh, process, we very detailedly uh, get deep dive in humans, uh, in people, in target audience, to uh, see how our ideas uh, would work on them. Different for Europeans, different for uh, Turkish people, and different from for different um, demographics. Okay, great. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, you know, uh, even though we here, like if you look at Turkey or if we even we look at our own ca country, we're not too positive when it comes to taking negative criticism or negative feedback. Mm -hmm. But I think that is where uh, a growth of an individual lies. And that's where, you know, if we learn to really uh, accept it in a positive way, uh, we see ourselves and everybody grow in a better way. But I completely agree with you that, you know, it is less accepted here, completely. In uh, culture, and also in culture, for example, we are building a platform in the Netherlands and uh, when, you, when you make people to choose a gender, uh, there's a male, female, and they gave it other genders. It is not so common here. Yeah. That's why if you show, if you show that it's the torch and that it's been used now here. But if you show it, and uh, some people might say, why do you use it? Mm, I want I don't want to use your app or I don't want to use your game by app. So the culture is also another uh, aspect for um, before another uh, detail before we uh, deep dive before making the gamification design. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to you, Salaf. I would want to ask that when we talk about uh, emotional intelligence and uh, you know gamification, what is really the relationship between these two? Because it's, I feel that there is a close relationship. And yes, there is. Acha, um, listen, you had asked me another question, and I, which I forgot to answer. Okay, if there is a need to uh, expand and you know expand these services and you know. Yeah. Uh, more uh, start more uh, centers like this so yes um, I fully agree with you there is a dire need to have such kind of centers and therapies and young people to come into these professions because we are operating at a very very uh, you know a very small scale as compared to the need that prevails here uh, and you know it's um, it's, a, it's still a very while it is a very um, you know well recognized profession of allied health sciences, but in Pakistan we are still a seedling. We are still under Department of Social Welfare, Special Education. We are still not talking of mainstreaming. We are not talking of inclusion. So we need more and more younger people to come in this field, study this, and you know. Um, take part in this you know uh, in in this case i'm i'm uh, let me tell you it's very rewarding and it's so it feels so wonderful to work with kids now coming back to your question uh i will just, just describe you a, a little bit okay emotional intelligence is actually again social skills keys are here you know, emotions, uh, humare, what what are we? Our emotions are what we see around us, what we feel, how we react to other people, and how we react in different circumstances. Uh, so yes, gamification, uh, again, uh, you know, when we, when we work with kids, again, supposing there's a game like Candyland. Yeah. And uh, so when we play that game, so children are getting rewards, but they're not getting those rewards in their hands. So they keep on working and working and in that what they learn most what i believe emotional intelligence is about going through a healthy process of learning where you are not so worried about your performance and result I, I, this is to me what emotional emotional intelligence is where you are not competing in everything but you are performing at a level where you are comfortable with what with what you are doing 
so when we play such games with kids and we see them achieving and they we see their motivation to do better and their need for a material gratification reduces so i i i do feel that you know we it does play it is connected and it does play a very important role in uh, i mean but yeah, again in pakistan we have very limited research limited opportunities but yes it does it does help there is a connection yeah true sadly our country has has a uh, very little opportunities when it comes very to very little opportunities there's and very few options and yeah. here uh, it is our first battle is with the with the parents when we use this like the word game yeah. they say oh this this the child can do at home also why are you doing this with him with my kid so right. as uh, alper said it's about mindset it's about you know demographics it's about different regions so uh you know it 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 is he's he, i agree with him on this he's absolutely right yeah, true very true okay moving on to you sabita uh, we were first talking about the user journey and everything now i will talk to you uh, because whenever you know a designer gets a brief uh you know you design it but you're designing from a user's perspective at the end of the day right so if we look at the experiences from a user engagement perspective right uh how is it being uh, uh, i'm not sure how uh, what all your clientele is uh, and the, your company that deals with it but when we look at different industries and the different products that you're designing for those uh, you know how really the user engagement is differing through that so i think so for uh, one just to like give a little bit more context of such so our product is a very horizontal product so what we hope is that like it's one platform that many different people are able to use and sort of benefit from so it's not multiple products for multiple industries but we do have to sort of i think and that's where gamification plays a role right that like how do you actually engage users who are coming in from different industries so just a very simple sort of tactic that we use we say that hey our product is a very hard product uh, to sort of like get onboarded on because there's a lot of work that needs to go in you like you know data has to come in from like like customers products and like you know it has to come in it get like they have to instrument they have to do a lot of work on their side before it comes so we said that okay we'll put in sample data and we'll let you explore the product so that like you don't have to do all of that work but when we do that we actually say hey tell us a little bit like tell us what industry are you coming from because we'll have a different data set if you're coming from a media company or we'll have a different data set if you're coming from a financial services company or uh, from an e-commerce company but then that's not enough it also matters what your role is so that's what i said in the beginning when i was talking about like that personalized gamification and i think that's probably where the future is that like in the past like personalization was something that you assumed that only the netflixes and amazons of the world can do because they can spend like millions and millions and millions of dollars to do that but can be democratized it's so like okay so you did that you you we know your industry do we know your expertise level for a product like us do, are you a data analyst who who really understands how to do analyses on the uh, user data or are you an engineer or are you a designer who may not be a, like who may not be someone who's very technical or are you like you know are you like somebody from hr or so all of those things what's your level of expertise you could be somebody from hr but you may be not a no novice user you've been doing it forever so like all of these things then customize give you a customized experience of what you can play with to get a sense of the product sure. and all of that is basically trying to keep the user engaged and hook them enough to give them a taste of the product enough that they're ready to commit because the commitment level that is required for a product like amplitude is very high in the beginning to get benefit out of and then that's the same with pretty much any enterprise right like i mean there was uh, i was recently reading this quote i think it was forester or gartner that said that the 
the digital transformation in like these like very large enterprises that were very slow to adopt sort of digital uh, that has been accelerated by seven years during the pandemic. Wow. So there are a lot of companies who we traditionally thought. So, for example, I don't know, like traditionally, you wouldn't have thought that like a Burger King would want to understand sort of user behavior because, you know, you assume that like or a McDonald's would because you assume that these are traditional brick and mortar companies, but they're sort of online uh, presence and digital sort of uh, footprint has increase so fast and so much that they really, really need to understand all of these things. And that's what they would come to a product like us for, because they're like, okay, help me understand this. If you help me understand it, I'll be able to better serve my customers. Yeah. Um, so again, I think that like, uh, just to like taking it back to engagement. So like, like what we do in order to try and engage our users is very different than what let's say the McDonald does. So like McDonald would probably say, I remember you from the last time I knew you ordered a spicy chicken uh, burger. Uh, do you want to order this again? Or so, but that's very personalized sort of uh, way of engaging with a user, right? Or if you order this, I will also throw in a free Coke. Is that gamification? It is kind, it's not maybe very traditionally, like, I mean, like you wouldn't traditionally associate it with that, but that is sort of like very personalized sort of gamification of content that you're surfacing for the user. And that increases engagement that, that you see sort of like when, when I do that, like, I mean, every time, like, I mean, I, I use DoorDash. I don't know if that's the, uh, the service that you guys use in Pakistan for food delivery. They do these kinds of tactics and I'm like, okay, uh, I remember I, I tasted that. I'll, I'll order this again. <laughs> and so you see a benefit of people understanding what my behavior is and then leveraging that behavior to increase my engagement. In, with their product yes very true so yeah we don't uh you know by the, the thing that you told we have food panda over here which is really you know very frequently used and yes the all of these you know even uh you know if we look at uber all of these places that are very close to user uh you know user engagement they all use these tactics and uh, and it's it's great how it's happening i am taking the same question to you i would ask you that, you know, uh, when we talk about the HR industry, how Sabika just mentioned that, you know, during COVID days and all, uh, do you think that, you know, even in recruitment, gamification, things have, uh, have actually, uh, you know, escalated to another level and uh, how those challenges are being tackled by the HR industry for those who did not adapt to these ways earlier and are forced to look into and those who were doing all of these, but probably have to enhance their uh, game a little you look into other things yeah um i think that's 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 a brilliant question because uh things are still evolving it's uh, a little too soon to say but we we started operating in a virtual world when the covid happened and i think some of the companies that got the first mover advantage really really created that impact and i think um you know this year a lot of companies are now learning from the best practices of the companies who have actually adapted to these things even for recruitment i can give an example that you know we we usually um run our management training and internship program we go to the campuses traditionally we used to do that we used to interact with kids this time everything was virtual end to end you know not from the test but from the interviews the process of so technology actually became very important there um so i think uh, it's the, the important part again I would like to highlight would be that the sustainability I remember when I was becoming a first line manager in one of my previous organizations and I'll also pick um, on what Sadaf talked about on emotional intelligence um, yeah. they made us go through a first line leadership experience and uh, there was a business simulation game and we had to obviously at the end of the day you need to look at what profit are you bringing to the business that's the bottom line Absolutely. that's what you need to bring no matter you know how how good you are, how you treat people, etc. But at the end of the day, you were there to make money. And those situations were also nerve wracking because there was competition. There was there were like four groups competing for the same and we would get points towards the end. And they tested our emotional intelligence during that assessment center. How do we make decisions, our analytical skills and how do we behave with each other during that pressure? And I think these things have helped and 
coming back to your question, I think companies are now start starting to adapt to these things. I remember there was C factor which was introduced, and everybody wanted to do that. But yeah. my my question always was um, to these people: Okay, what's the output that you're looking at? Are you looking at data? Are you looking at are, are they matching with the company values or the kind of um, assessment uh, KPIs that you have? Are they matching with those? But I think companies have started, even the service providers of these uh, gamified products, they're now um, looking into these things. They're talking to the customers, you know, there's small focus groups where they talk to clients that, okay, what is it that you want? How can we help? Um, for example, we have an employee assistance program where employees you know, uh, in that in the times of stress and during the COVID situation, they could, you know, talk to an online counselor. They don't need HR there. Yeah, so sure. they can talk to a professional counselor. I spoke to them and I told them that, you know, this is what it is. How can we gamify their experience? How I want to see how they're feeling. What's the mood like? Um, can they play small online games? Because, you know, during this COVID time, we used to play games like Escape Room, again, gamified, but again, under pressure. So you could, it was a good tool for us to evaluate a lot of people, how people behave in different situations. So I think um, the more, uh, in, in Pakistan, the more companies they start using it, especially the local companies. So I think we will be able to boost this within the HR. Great. Very well put. Okay, uh, moving on to you, Alper. I would ask you this: that of course, uh, COVID has changed things for everyone, everywhere. And you know, there was a time that you were thinking this is going to go away, but uh, I think it's here to stay for a while. Uh, I would want to ask you this also: that you know, uh, being the pioneer of gamification, uh, inter, you know, the, being the part of the company who's been, you know, working with all of this and uh, being so, uh, you know, closely related with this, with gamification and all. How do you, do you really think this is the future and uh, would everybody be forced to actually look into these things and what more uh, it, is there that we can use these game elements and, you know, what is something that everybody can take out of, uh, you know, from this right now? Uh, actually, games uh, are not uh, the tools that we are using for now. As long as the humanity was ex were, uh, were being existing in on Earth, uh, games were being used for uh, improving their um, physical attributions uh, against nature. And as time passes, we use it for different things. And Think about the baby. You don't teach a baby how to play a game. Maybe you teach rules of a game, but a baby instinctively plays, like eating, like in other uh, human uh, human behaviors. And that's why uh, we have to know that firstly, games not something new for us, but uh, we notice newly, recognize newly the games, the uh, motivation of games because. Uh, there are more than millions of hours that we are spending on games without any return. And there's a very big motivation. And, uh, and is it future? Yes, it is future. For example, him is using gamification, he's getting benefits. And his, uh, her company is uh, in, uh, in competition, in race with other companies. And when she gets uh, benefits, the other companies will see, yes, we are, we are doing something um, is missing, we are missing something. What is it? Scamification. So they are going to use gamification also. That's why it is a feature. Yes, it's a feature, and we are uh, witnessing the results. And as success stories uh, spread more, I've been told more, uh, people will uh, turn their face to gamification, to games. That's why, yes, it's a feature, I think. It's still uh, being used, but in the future, it will be more, uh, be aware, the awareness will be more. And how people can be, get benefit from it? I think uh, it's an approach. Gamification is an approach. They have to read books, get educations from experts, and uh, see the what they see the philosophy of games, uh, the details of gamification, the theories like flow, like models, like DJ folk, and how can they can use? Uh, they can ask themselves, how can I use them on my uh, private life. For example, they, uh, they can start gamifying their lives. After that, uh, they can gamify their professional life. They can gamify their jobs, their tasks, and it continue like that. 
and companies also will use like that because companies are consist of people. When people use this gamification benefits from their companies also use it. And new models, new frameworks, and uh, new tools uh, will be built in the future. Better tools will be built, and it will continue to grow like um, esports. Think about 20 years ago, how many people are playing multiplayer games, and nowadays uh, it's uh, its value is uh, just like NBA, a sport. The very big uh, market now. Like game change like that, game change will be more reliable and uh, more beneficial and more alert for humanity, not for a sector or for a country, for all humanity. And like we can see China, China gamified country, like to some uh, points. They are, they are gamified being a nationalist. You can use it everywhere. Very true. I completely agree with Alper that I think that, you know, gamification is inherently in all of us and this will be the way forward, uh, you know, and, and we are to see a lot that that is, you know, that, that, that this uh, has to offer. So with this, thank you so much, all of you. With this, we have reached to the end of our episode and the series. It has been a pleasure hosting you all and all of those wonderful guests who have been, uh, you know, a part of this show. I have enjoyed the interesting insights and the diversified wisdom that's been imparted here. So that's it for now. This is Sinrizvi signing off. Take care and stay blessed, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.